Okay, Ahmed, welcome. Thank you, Amin. Thank you for having me today. My pleasure. Ahmed, tell me, uh, could you, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Well, it's never an easy thing to introduce yes. oneself, but I guess I can give you the gist of it. Um, my name is Ahmed Azouk. I'm currently a lecturer at the Colonoma Superior de Bouzereal, uh, also consulted to the Council of Nations, mm -hmm. the Algerian Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been teaching also a number of years at the University of Algiers too, English department, mostly lecturing on Western civilization and Western literature. Okay. I've also worked in various places like the Institute of Diplomacy and International Relations located within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, my field of interest lately has been mostly philosophy and literature. Okay. But with what is happening lately, obviously, it's really hard not to rekindle my interest for historical matters. And I assume that you have been witnessing that there is a lot of influx of information trending on Palestinian issue at the Palestinian cause lately on social media. Yes. And when there is a, such a huge influx of information on any historical matter, there is good things and there are bad things too. Yeah. So I think it's a good, this podcast today, this episode, is a really a good opportunity to increase our awareness about Zionism. I'm here to talk about the history of Zionism and how come it has succeeded how come it has ac accomplished what it has accomplished, despite uh, the controversies that surround it, surround it, sorry. Okay, so where does the name Zionism come from? Okay, that's a good thing. Well, um, Zion in the Old Testament, in, uh, or in the Old Testament, which is part of the Christian Bible or the Hebrew Bible, uh, simply refers to Jerusalem, to Palestine, the land itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I, uh, what I suggest is that we are going to deal with Zionism through its stages of development. Okay. So we're going to deal with its, the, the movement itself, the, m the Zionist movement as we know it today, was born in the 19th century. But we're going far back in order to... Um, to trace to the roots of the idea. Maybe. Exactly, because yeah. there, are, there are many things. Because Zionism as we know it today, most people don't realize that it was never as clear-cut as we know it today. Mm -hmm. And we take it for granted. But there are many, many things that uh, surround it that we need to be concerned with. Yes. So, what I, so we're going to talk about its very roots, its ancient roots, and then we're, I'm going mostly to focus on the 19th century and 20th century versions of Zionism. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to finish with 1948, the first uh, Palestinian-Israeli war, also known as the Nakba. Yes. So um, well the way we're going to approach it is that we're going to take a series of Zionist claims, right? Mm -hmm. And we're just going to demystify them. We're going to assess the legitimacy or the illegitimacy of these claims, mm -hmm. right? And I think the most obvious one, usually the first thing that we hear from Zionist intellectuals or Zionist or pro-Jewish, pro-Zionist uh, people, figures, mm -hmm. is that uh, the land belongs to the Israeli people because they were there before the Arabs, before the Muslims, and so forth. So this is the basic claim of Zionists, is that in a nutshell, before Islam, there was Christianity, and before Christianity, there was the advent of Judaism. So in simply put, they claim that we were there in the land of Palestine before you guys, before the Arabs and before the Muslims. So it belongs to us. And also that they were promised uh, that land by God. Exactly, himself. yes. So that's a re so that's a religious rhetoric. That's a religious mm -hmm. uh, idea that is found in the Old Testament, indirectly and indirectly as well. That at some point in their history or uh, in their lives, that they will get back to the kingdom of Judea, to the kingdom of Israel. Mm -hmm. So let's take this first claim that the land historically belongs to them. Yes. Is it true or is it untrue or does it have element of truth? Were there people that lived there before the Arabs and so forth? Um, so let me just give you a, a flavor of what this sounds like from Zionist people. And this comes from Netanyahu, current uh, Israeli prime minister, right? Go ahead. So he says, and this was just a couple of days ago because he was speaking in an interview with a Western outlet, news outlet. And he says, the Jewish people have lived in what is now the state of Israel for about 4,000 years. We were conquered by the Romans, by the Byzantines, and they really did a lot of bad things to us. But contrary to what most people think, 
they never exiled us. It is only with the Arab conquest of the seventh century that the Arabs started taking over the land of the Jewish. It is under the Arab conquest that the Jews lost their homeland. The Arabs were the colonials, the Jews were the natives. The Jewish people were dispossessed. So in a nutshell, really, it's, he's just saying again the main, uh, the main claim that I was referring to earlier. We were there before the Arabs, and the Arabs only came towards the seventh century with the advent of Islam. So we were before there before there before you. So the land historically belongs to us. Now, how do we assess this? Uh, and also, you find in religious rhetoric, mm -hmm. the, the most Zionist people will refer to the Jewish-Roman wars that started in the year 70, uh, 70 AD. So the first Jewish-Roman war took place in 70 AD, and the Jewish and the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple of the Jews, and you find that ever since the Jews have incorporated in their religious rhetoric uh, and I also in their religious practices something that amounts to a collective memory of returning back to Jerusalem. For example, you may have heard of the Passover meal that takes mm. place in, in, um, in Jewish practices every year. Yes. So they, it's a kind of remembrance where f Jewish families gather together and they have a meal and, and they have a, a number of prayers. But each time, each time when the meal ends, when they finish eating, they end their meals with this sentence, next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem. So that they will tell you that uh, 2,000 years ago, the Romans kicked us, they exiled us, they destroyed our city, and it is our utmost right to return to it 2,000 years afterwards. Okay, okay? so that is and also was part... was this uh, uh, a long-standing tradition or was this new? Uh, this has started uh, mostly in the 16th century. Okay. So it didn't start... So implementing this particular sentence in the Passover meal started around the 16th century. And would, it say, in the 16th century, mm -hmm. would it have been actually difficult for these families to establish themselves in Jerusalem at that time? Well, not really. We'll, g we'll get to that because uh, you have to, re to remember that ever since the 7th century, when with the advent of Islam and then the conquest of Jerusalem by Arabs, even though Jewish people and Christian people, non-Muslim people, mm -hmm. had to pay a sort of tax, mm -hmm. dimma, right? But they still could live there peacefully. Uh, so they long, could own things. There. Exactly. So mm -hmm. long as they could, uh, uh, so long as they paid their dues. Uh, this the is protection proven. tax. Yeah. Exactly. This is proven historically speaking, and it's not only in Jerusalem. You know about Islamic Spain. So this is. Coexistence and co-inhabitation between Muslims and non-Muslims, it's a proven thing. Yes. So now we talk about the claim, that the, the main claim that and the excuse land... Me, especially yeah. between Jews and Muslims, mm -hmm. uh, long history of cohabitation. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, for example, a, the, a lot of the issues that happened, religious issues that happened, or religious wars that happened throughout history that concerned the Muslims were with the Christians. The Crusades are yes. a good example. Yes. All of that. But in terms of Jewish and Muslim co uh, coexistence, it was really... There was never really a big problem. Exactly. Yes. It was mostly, mostly peaceful. Yes. We have in Algeria, we have in almost every big city, we have at least one synagogue. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. every single big city. So in Blida, we have a synagogue. Very well, famous one. Well, yes. You ha we also have to remember that Algeria was the land that sort of protected the Jews ever since 1492 yes. with the Inquisition that took place in Spain. For people that don't know, but in a nutshell, you had the Catholic rule with Ferdinand and Isabella. They started uh, persecuting and prosecuting non-Catholics, uh, um, non heretics, mm -hmm. even uh, people that, did were that were Christians but were not Catholics, but mostly Jews. And when the Jews had to leave, where did they go? What is the closest proximity that they had is North Africa, yes. Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria. A substantial number of Jewish people came to live in Algeria, and it was completely peaceful until, until the arrival of the French, but that is besides the point right now. Yes. So let's talk about the main claim. Were the Jewish people really the, f the, true, the first true inhabitants of Palestinian land? Well, Anthropologists, okay, and historicals, and even biblical mm -hmm. historians will tell you that the earliest, earliest, by which I mean the oldest recorded people 
to have inhabited the land of Palestine were people called the Canaanites. Okay. Now the question is, who were the Canaanites? So the oldest we know about. The oldest we know about, but most yes. likely the f the tr first true indigenous people to the Palestinian land were called the Canaanites. Now the question is, who were they? Even though information is scarce, but we still have enough in order to to have a general idea about these people. So these people um, came around to came around Palestine in the Bronze Age, 3,000 years BC, mm -hmm. and they established small villages, and yes. then they, these small villages grew into towns, and then these towns grew into cities. So clearly, unlike what was taking place, for example, at ancient Egypt at the same time, e ancient Egypt was unified under a single pharaoh. Yes. This was not the case for the Canaanites. It was, it was a, a city-state kind of system. It means like the Greeks. Yes, exactly. It was that each of these cities were independent from one another, politically mm. and economically. Mm. And we know this because they were fortified and there were different ranges of uh, conflicts between one another. Mm. This could range from mere skirmishes to full-fledged wars. Yes. We also know that these people uh, had so a culture of, so of sorts. We know a little bit about re their religion, for example. Watch out your phone. Is it okay? Yeah, it's all right. So we know, for example, a little bit about their religion. They were pagans. They were not monotheistic, okay. unlike Jews or Muslims or Christians. And we also know that they also were the first inhabitants of the city Jerusalem. Now, the first interesting fact about Jerusalem is the name itself. Yes. Now, if you ask any Jewish, Jew, Jewish person, or especially a Zionist, they will tell you that Jerusalem is, is extrapolated from the word Shalom which means in Hebrew, salutation or hello. Mm -hmm. we, and this is not the case. In fact, Jerusalem comes from ancient correspondences between ancient Egypt and the Canaanites. It's how the ancient Egyptians used to refer to the Canaanites who lived around the area of Jerusalem. They called it Yerushalem, which means f uh, worshippers of the god Shalem. Shalem was a, a Canaanite deity. So that's the first interesting fact is that even now, understanding Jerusalem as an extrapolation of a, a Hebrew word is a modern as understanding of the name of the city. But the name itself refers to something completely different. It's in fact a, ba a pagan reference. So that's something that most people don't know. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, and this was a study conducted in 2020, and it's op accessible online. It is a DNA study. So the scientists, what they have done is that they have dug up 73 Canaanite bodies, skeletons, remains of uh, Canaanite uh, skeletons, and they sampled them, and they went to the Levant, mostly, the, especially, they focused on the area of Palestine. So they sampled people, a considerable number of people, both Jews and Arabs. And can you guess what the results are? Yeah, tell me. Both people, both Jews and both Mus uh, Muslims and both indigenous Arab Palestinians share the same DNA. Because they are both Semites. E all right, okay, that's exact. Well, yes, yes, that's mostly because of it. But what it tells us is that the Canaanites are the descendants of both people, right? Okay, all and the ancestors. So exactly, and mm -hmm. in fact, the same study says that uh, the Saudis and the Syrians have the highest percentage matching Canaanite DNA. Okay. So if the Arabs really wanted to, they could make the case that <laughs> they were there longer, the way longer before the Jewish people, yeah. because they have a higher percentage matching yeah. Canaanite if it was DNA. Yeah, if, uh, if the Palestinian-Israeli conflict was actually about ancestry Ex heritage, yes. Then yeah, then maybe the Saudi went <laughs> with the word. Uh, exactly. The so yeah. it doesn't make much sense to say that we were there before you, because our ancestor Abraham was the first inhabitant, and then his descendants mm -hmm. were the first inhabitants of the land. When we know, thanks to anthropologists and thanks to archaeology, archaeology, that there were people living there before, and they are called Canaanites, and both Jews and Arabs are descended from these people. So it's literally impossible that you were there before them and that Arabs only showed up in the seventh century. Yes. You see, it's mathematically impossible. It's an historical impossibility. Mm -hmm. So that's the first issue. Uh, so so historical, uh, we, we understand that you have historical ties to the land and we respect that. 
Yeah. No one is denying that. We know that Jews lived there for a number of years. But you can't claim the sole exclusivity of having lived there. It's, n it's not true. The second issue with this, and I'm here I'm going to refer to Edward Said. I'm not if you're, if you, you're familiar. I'm not, no, 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 no. All right, he's, uh, he's uh, Palestinian born, but also American Palestinian. And then he immigrated to America where he taught there. He's an Ameri Pal American Palestinian intellectual who defended, who is one of the most eloquent uh, defenders of the Palestinian cause. And he was asked about this issue. And he said, OK, let's admit it. Let's admit that you, Abraham was a Jew. Because as far as I'm, I know, Abraham is a patriarchal figure f present in three Abrahamic uh, yes. religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Mm -hmm. we all, uh, Muslim also believe in Abraham as being a prophet. Yes. Let's admit that uh, you have the sole exclusive claim to Abraham being your, your religious prophet and your religious patriarch. That is to say, he was a Jew. So what? How long ago was that? Yeah. That was uh, more than 3,000 years ago. Yes. It would be tantamount to me saying, or me to walking in the street and coming knocking on the door of your house, and you would come up and show me and say, hey, how, how are you? Say, listen, I know that you live here, and that you own the house, but I just wanted to tell you that my ancestor used to live here 3,000 3, years, years ago. ago. So I'm just going to give you 48 hours to leave. To leave. And if you don't do it, I'm probably going to do you. make <laughs> you forcefully leave. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It would be tantamount. Let's imagine, I mean, that I, you, you, uh, you, you go for a DNA test right now, and you find out that there is Swedish, you, that you have Swedish ancestry in your genetics. And so what? What are I you going to, to do? I go to Sweden and forcibly remove people exactly. from their houses. Exactly, you're going to use the DNA test in, order in your visa application, and then when you once you're there, you're going to claim your land because one of your ancestors used to live there. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. History is organic; it changes. Land changes. The claim to the land changes. Yes. And just because you got your butt kicked by the Romans two thousand years ago. It doesn't really give you the claim or the entitlement to dispossess other people, that is to say, indigenous Palestinian people. It doesn't give you the, the right to dispossess them and to exile them yes. just because the Romans exiled you 2,000 years ago. They have nothing to do with that. Yeah. You see? And uh, so the, the claim, the first claim, that we have historical, ex an exclusive historical claim to the land is completely fabricated and it doesn't hold any weight. The problem with what they do is that they base their claims on religious texts. They base it on the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. This is not, listen, we all have our sacred texts, but no one, no one claims them to be historical evidence. Yes. Because religion is first and foremost a matter of what? Of personal convictions and beliefs. And personal beliefs. You can't you know. use because you can ask any anthropologist, he will tell you there is no archaeological evidence for the existence of Abraham. Mm -hmm. But you choose to believe in it, and we respect that. Yes. And every set of religion has their own sets of beliefs. Yes. But you can't tell me that we have, we have an historical, exclusive historical claim to the land because it says so in my Bible. That's not historical proof. Absolutely. That's not how historians and anthropologists uh, work historical evidence. So the first claim that, we histor that Zionists have an historical claim is completely, uh, completely untrue. Yes, yes. Uh, so it's basically propaganda. Yes, it's probably propaganda. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those p for the people that are interested in reading the study, it's called the Genomic, the Genomic History of the Bronze Age in the Southern Levant. Okay? Mm -hmm. and it's and it's all accessible online. You can find it in a science uh, review called cell.com. Okay. So it's easily accessible. All right. So now that we have talked about the uh, we have talked about the ancient roots of Zionism, now we're going to move into the, the 19th century for, uh, context, and it's probably the most important one because that's where we see the birth of modern Zionism as we know it today. Mm -hmm. Right, but before that, just to give a context for the city of Jerusalem and Palestine in the 19th century. 19th century Palestine was under Ottoman rule. Ottoman Empire uh, rose in, again, I think in the 15th or the 16th century. And ever since then, it expanded its territories to various places, North Africa, and also in the Middle East, in the Levant. And Palestine w was one of those territories acquired. But since there was a close bond 
and the religious prospects of two uh, regions. Ever since the Arab conquest, ha Palestine had been Muslim, mm -hmm. and the Ottomans, the Turks themselves, were Muslims. Yes. So it th there wasn't that big of a change in their lifestyles. So there mm -hmm. was a close bond between the indigenous people who were living in Palestine and the new rulers that came about. That is to say, the Ottomans. Yes. Right. Okay. But elsewhere in Europe, something else was ha happening. Now you mentioned that um, that both Arabs and Jews were Semitic people. Even though this categorization of race and ethnicity by modern star standards is obsolete, not many people Absolutely. use it. Absolutely. But yeah. we still use Semi we still use the categorization of Semitic uh, languages. Jews and Arabs are both Semitic language speaking people, whereas countries Western countries are most likely going to speak Indo-European I think the um, people hear of the word Semitism mm. the most when they hear about anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and uh, some have mentioned to me that it's uh, quite ironic when you call an Arab yes anti-Semitic what do you think yes I think I know what they're referring to because it's a sort of a technical misnomer yeah because since Arab people are also Semitic speaking language people and Jews are also the same and we have the same roots and the same ancestors so to call an Arab um, anti-Semitic would be anti-Semitic person would be tantamount to saying that I uh, and the Arab would be hating themselves yes, yes. I understand because uh, because there's a deep culture uh, of racism mm -hmm. in Europe and maybe America the United States all right so, so they try to to maybe understand the conflicts according to to their own issues yes yes I, I i think this is a good point that you have just risen and i think we need to clarify something about the term terminology itself about the word where does it come from anti-semitism mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the word was coined by uh, if i'm not mistaken by an austrian scholar an intellectual someone called uh, maurice steinscheider or something okay. like that and the first time he has ever, this is the first person that has ever used the term. He was referring to someone who was attacking not only Jews, but also Arabs. Okay. So the first usage of the term was correct, was appropriate. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so he had called and he had said that this person, I think he was Eric Wilhelm or something like that. He had said that Eric Wilhelm is showing anti Semitism. Mm -hmm. Because Wilhelm had said, that the Aryan races are superior to the Semitic races, Arabs and Jews. So the first usage of the term was correct. But throughout time, for whatever reasons, especially Jewish intellectuals have appropriated the term in order to only to refer to prejudices against the Jewish people. So mm. this was only done throughout time. But yes. the first usage of the term ever was appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I think this is mostly correlated to what was happening in the 19th century because there weren't as many persecution against Arab people the whole talk was about Jewish people that most people was were thinking in terms okay the Semitic are mostly Jewish people and so they appropriated the term mm. uh, that's at least my uh, my reading of the, uh, the matters that took place yeah. so that's about the terminology like I said in the 19th century there was an increasing anti-semitism in Europe in various places of Europe Russia, France, maybe you have heard about the Dreyfus affair, you know, a, a s French soldier who was Jewish, who was kicked out of the military because of he, w he was Jewish and then he was reinstated, uh, Austria, in various places in Europe, a lot of prosecution and persecution against the Jews was taking place. Yes. So this is one of the motivations for the rise of Zionism. Yes. Okay, so this is the first thing. And this, the other thing that we need to know about the 19th century is that since, since there was a lot of anti-Semitism growing in Europe, there was a need for Europe to, to for U European Jews to grow with a discourse of their own, a new rhetoric of their own. They clearly understood that they could not, what? They couldn't mm -hmm. integrate European society and that no matter what they did, they would never give up their faith. Yes. And clearly Europeans were more and more fed up with the Jews for whatever reasons, pre-stereotypes or factual matters. Or racism. Yes. The th the it was clear that Europe 
had an ongoing issue with the Jews. Mm. So they started to look for what? For solutions. And this is where Zionism starts to show its tail. Mm. You might have heard of someone called Theodor Herzl. Yes. Yes, he's the f called justly as the spiritual father of Zionism. S Herzl was a uh, Hungaro-Austrian intellectual. He was a writer, but he was also a political Why activist. Why is it every time we have a problem, it's the Austrians? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Well, it's always uh, yeah. it, it's a bit like the Germans, and the, the, in fact, you know, some, and this is my own opinion of the matter. But ever since I has I have started teaching Western history, the idea of West, the West, when you know of a Western civilization, the more you learn about it, the more distaste you grow for it. Yeah. Because they are always, always the the in, uh, they are always the in taking the initiative to cause some racial issues, some wars, they are always, it's, 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 you, when you, you make a comparison between the Oxi the Orient and Western civilizations, West, ever since the 19th centuries and their imperial ventures have caused way too many problems to be ignored. Yeah. And most of the issues that we are seeing today go back to Western initiatives. Yeah, That's Western imperialism. Yes, Western imperialism. Mm. Uh, has been cancerous, uh, can, sorry, cancerous for modern societies. Yeah. There is hardly, hardly any modern problem that, that can't we be cannot trace. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that we cannot trace because yeah. of Western imperialism. Yeah. So I guess I was just to return to Theodor Herzl. Yes. In 1896, mm -hmm. he publishes uh, the Judenstaat, the Jewish state. And he uh, pretty much sets up the basics the foundation for Zionism. He says that Jewish integration in European society is near impossible. So they need to establish a new homeland of their own. Mm -hmm. And of course that homeland would be Palestine. But what most people don't realize is that Herzl himself wasn't exactly wedded to the idea of a return to Israel or to the land of Palestine. Mm -hmm. For him, he, I see Herzl as a pragmatic man. So long as the Jews had a state of their own, he didn't really care that much what it would be. Initially, he suggested Uganda, and then he suggested Argentina. Could you imagine the fate of history if that had been the case? Yeah. But then, as a pragmatic man, he realized that the Jews weren't that enthusiastic about going to Argentina, to Argentina or Uganda. Yeah. So he, r he shifted his rhetoric towards, pa uh, towards Israel. And this tells us something interesting about the whole thing. Is that th your spiritual reader didn't care that much about your spirituality because he, if he really truly cared and if he truly believed in his ar argument, he would have suggested Palestine from the get-go, no. right? But instead he was just caring about establishing a homeland. Okay. So what does it say about this? That there is a sort of hypocrisy in this whole movement from the get-go. Yes. But he wasn't the only, the only Zionist thinker that were propagating these ideas, this Zionist thinking. There were other people. One of them was also Leon Pinsker, Rus a Polish-born, but was writing from Russia. In fact, he was writing well before uh, Herzl. In 1882, he published a work called Auto-Emancipation. Okay. He also establishes and he sets up the grounds for the same ideas, that integration within European society for the Jews is a delusion, yes. that we will never establish it. So we need to establish a land of our own. Of mm -hmm. our own. Preferably, that needs to be Palestine. Yes. So this is the 19th century for the rise of m Zionism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the establishment of Zionism. This, uh, this is the, the groundwork as set by people like Theodor Herzl. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we move on to 1917 with the declaration of the Balfour, uh, with the, uh, the issuance of the Balfour Declaration by the British state. Mm -hmm. And if you remember the Balfour Declaration, is is important because it's for the first time, for the first time, a non-Zionist entity, mm -hmm. that is to say the British state, grants support for a Zionist cause. Yes. So th this is the first time it happens. It was very brief. The text itself was a letter addressed to Baron Rothschild. And in, if you remember the famous words, Her Majesty's government views with favor the establishment of a national home for the Jewish population in the land of Palestine. Yes. So that's, most historians 
be it non-Muslims or Muslims, mm -hmm. all agree that 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 is the damning cause for the Palestinian for the Palestinian cause, because that's the first time, and it's not just any entity. As it is with the Hindu and Pakistani yes. issue, as it is with uh, so many other issues. Mm. Yes. And like I said, it's not just any entity. Yeah. Britain was still the greatest power in the world. So for the British government to issue a their support for the Zionist cause, that makes it twice as hard for the indigenous Palestinian people to fight for their cause. Yeah. Because once you have the greatest power, America was not yet the greatest power in the world yet. Yes. It was not the greatest imperial power. It was still Britain. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, the empire was disintegrate, the disintegrating, disintegrating yeah. but it was still the greatest power in the world. Yes. And to give its support to such a cause was going to make it twice as hard for the Palestinian cause. Yeah. Now, a lot of people have debated why has Britain done so? Why did they grant their support to the Palestinian to to the, to the Zionist cause. Why did they issue that proclamation? Uh, so according to what I heard, they actually granted support to three different factions. But I'm not sure about this claim. To three different factions? Meaning they granted support... No, actually they promised uh, the Saudis mm, that they okay. would give them uh, uh, the land of Jerusalem. Mm. They promised also the Zionists. And uh, I forgot which third fraction, but um, I have no... I'm not sure about this. Case. This is actually true. Uh, not surprisingly, mm -hmm. the British, as an imperial power, was also playing a double game. Yeah. That is to say, they were making promises to everyone. Yes. A lot of people wonder, has there been a Palestinian revolt during that time? Yes. We do know that there was such a thing called as Palestinian nationalism. Mm -hmm. One of the most famous figures, for example, was someone called uh, Azdin al Qassam, who had led a revolt in the late 1920s against the British. Because the British were smuggling, for example, weapons for the, uh, for the Jews in secret, while they had forbidden doing so, or they had forbidden the, uh, the British mandators that were present in Palestine to sell weapons for the Palestinians. Yes. So as you see, it's a, it's, it's a form of double standards. Mm -hmm. So he had led a revolt. So th that's, in fact, Palestinians consider him to be the first true national hero that had revolted against an imperial power. Yes. And they had made promises even before that to him as well. Mm -hmm. During the First World War, that is to say, if you help us fight against the, uh, you remember that Britain and France were fighting against Germany and the Axis powers. Yes. So they had pro promised the Palestinians that if you help us, we will establish an Arab state. Mm -hmm. It was not a Palestinian state, but in general, it was an Arab state. Yes. It turned out that it was a lie. Mm -hmm. It was untrue. Right. And they made also promises in the Second World War and yes. so and so. So that's the 19th, uh, so s that's the context during the 20th uh, century Palestine. Now, just to return just a little bit before, because it's important, uh, I've asked you a question, why did the British support or uh, issue the Balfour Declaration? It's one of those issues that are hotly debated. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, give me plenty of reasons. In fact, the, the Prime Minister, the British Prime Minister during the time mm -hmm. when the declaration was issued, David Lord George, went on to write his memoirs, and he lists nine to... I think nine to ten reasons why he supported the Balfour Declaration, and most historians tell say that most of the reasons are smokescreen; they're not believable. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. One of the reasons he says, "Well, we used to have a Jewish scientist um, in our ranks, and he helped us during the First World War because he engineered something related to British R&D that helped them uh, with something that has to do with the shells, with the weapons that were used in the First World War." Okay. My question to you, I mean, can you truly believe that you would make such a statement supporting the establishment of a national l homeland, a national state for the Jewish community at the expense of the disposition of the Palestinian people just because there was some Jewish scientist who had helped with British R&D? No, it's impossible. Exactly. Yeah. So th this is a smokescreen reason. Just pay him a little bit of money and that's going to be his compensation. Exactly. With, that's right. Yes, you can't tell me that you 
supported the Balfour Declaration for services rendered by one guy, one Jewish guy. Yeah. It's w in no matter makes no sense. Exactly, no matter what his contribution to was to British R and D. Now, most historians agree or think of s a few reasons why they had uh, why the British had issued the Balfour Declaration. First one was for strategic for strategic reasons. The British seemed to believe that if they had they su they supported the establishment of an of a Jewish state, they would gain control of the Suez Canal and the uh, Sinai Peninsula. Okay. It turns out this was a complete miscalculation because the Pi Sinai Peninsula and the Suez Canal would be in control of the Egyptian state later on. Yes. Also, uh, a second reason, and this is quite important, we have spoken about Zionism, but there was such a thing called as Christian Zionism. Mm -hmm. These are Christian people that believe that the Jews belong in Israel for the simple reason that the second coming of Jesus in Christianity has a certain set of criteria and one of those criteria is that the Jews need to go back to Israel or okay. the land of Palestine. Okay. And For him to come back, you mean? Yes, yes. Okay. For the return of Jesus, there needs to be, again, this is a messi messiahic uh, message, in yeah. the sense that you know, for, for this prophecy to be fulfilled, to be accomplished, that the, the, the return of the Jewish people needs to happen in the land of Palestine. Yes. And this was a potent force. And we will see that with the recognition of the state of Israel by, the, by another Christian Zionist, Harry Truman, leader of the United States yes. in that time. So this was truly, so it's strategic uh, intentions, geopolitical intentions and purposes mixed with some zealous Christian Zionism that was mm -hmm. taking place. Mm -hmm. But also it was because of hard lobbying by the Zionists. Yes. You had people like Herzl and Pinsker lobbying. They were meeting and also the people th uh, like the Rothschilds. Mm -hmm. So they were helping and, and they were funding regimes, different regimes. They were making promises, you know, you know the expression that money talks. They promised different fundraisings for different regimes. Mm -hmm. So they were lobbying all across the boards with different political figures, with different political important in political people mm -hmm. so lobbying was taking place yes but also there was a lot of propaganda on the Zionist side yes let's go back to the 19th century uh, situation in Palestine and let me give you uh, a taste of what this sounds like when it comes to pro um, propaganda issued by the Zionists okay All right. So in the same speech, Netanyahu, mm -hmm. that I've, the same quotation that I was giving you earlier, he goes on to say that, you know what, regardless of our religious rhetoric, re regardless of our ex historical claim to the land, the land was empty anyway in 19th century. Mm -hmm. There was no one inhabiting the land. He says, the, w the exact word that he says, that he used were an empty barren land. Okay. So that's another Zionist claim that Palestine was mostly an empty barren li uh, land going well into the 19th century and well into the 20th century. Okay. Let me give you now an account. It's y you have probably heard of someone called Mark Twain, American. Mm -hmm. All right. Mark Twain was not a Jew and he was not a Zionist either. So you're probably asking me why are we quoting him? All right, let me just read you this account that he gives of Palestine because he visited the land of Palestine mm -hmm. in the 19th century. And it gives you an idea of the same propaganda used by the Zionists. Palestine, he says, was a desolate country whose soil is rich and was a, had a silent, mournful expanse. A desolation. We never saw a human being on the whole route, hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. And this is found in his book, The Innocents Abroad. Okay. Now, as, I, as I've said, Twain was not a Jew and he was not a Zionist. So why would he make up something like this? He didn't make it up. But the Zionists would use this kind of skewed narratives mm -hmm. and take it at face value and say and you know manipulate the general opinion the general public 
and say, listen, this is a non-Zionist, a non-Jew, yes. saying this. Yes. Now, a lot of historians, and again, I emphasize all of this because my, we're, our purpose here is mm -hmm. to analyze history in an objective way. Yes. So the evidence, the counter evidence that I'm going to provide for this comes from non-Muslim, non uh, from uh, non-Palestinian people. Yes. There's an historian called James L. Galvin who is specialized in mi Middle Eastern affairs. Mm -hmm. He has a book, The Modern Middle East, A History, and he takes this kind of account and he's interested. Are there, is Mark Twain telling the truth? It is not true. Let me give you some examples. Palestine, during the Ottomans, and late in the 19th century, had leading, and I'm saying leading, leading industries in exporting s things like what? Like wheat, cotton, olive oil, and soap. Okay. Now, do you care to explain to me, Amin, how can a desolate land where there is absolutely nobody have leading and exporting uh, industries in wheat, cotton, uh, cotton, olive oil, and soap? Not just in the region, but as far as Europe. Yes. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't speak to reason. It's a huge contradiction. Mm -hmm. But we also know that, yes, the Ottoman were the rulers, but since the Ottoman Empire was decreasing in territories and they couldn't sustain much of the empire that they used to have. An interesting situation grew in Palestine wh that was very similar where, uh, similar to what happened in Algeria. Mm -hmm. the, Al the Ottomans said that, okay, we are, we are going to claim the title that we are your rulers, but we're going to give you a kind of independence where you can do whatever you want, so long as you, c you plead allegiance to us. We're not really going to interfere in your affairs. This is what was taking place in Ottoman occupation in Algeria. Yes. And it's exactly the same thing that was taking place in Palestine. Mm -hmm. So you had cities in Palestine called technically municipalities. Mm -hmm. And they were, yes, independent from one another economically. But they had their thing going. They had all kinds of regulations taking place mm -hmm. because of what was happening in the Ottoman Empire. So they had, again, they had leading is industries, but also peasants, farmers, could not only keep the harvest of their work, but could also eventually buy back their lands. Mm -hmm. it was, I'm not saying it was easy, it was difficult, but it was a possibility that they could consider. Can it be said the same for the Jews of the 19th century in Europe? No way. Yeah. No way. As I've we say, we've said, a rise in anti-Semitism, Jews could not dream of owning their own businesses and living a peaceful life. Yeah. But this could be done in Palestine. So these kind of narratives are completely skewed and completely misleading. Now, why would Twain write an account like this? Yes, he did visit uh, Palestine, but he visited Palestine in the heat of summer. Do you know how hot it is during in Palestine in summer? Yeah. Would you go out? What, what, what are you expecting to, to see exactly? Yeah. So it doesn't really give you any... Besides, he was visiting the middle of nowhere in Palestine. Yes. He wasn't visiting the cities. Yeah. Didn't visit Jerusalem and whatnot and other big cities. So, so of course, if you, if you go to the Algerian desert... You're not going to find you, anybody, anybody. Exactly. Yeah. If, you, if you wander off the big cities and the main crowded places, what do you expect to find? Yes, and it's like going to a really desolate place in Algeria and, say and call the whole of Algeria desolate. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it's not ethical and it's not historically accurate. So I could go to Death Valley yes. and write about the United States that it's a completely empty country. Exactly, you can visit places in the United States, the Grand Canyon, and say, well, there's nothing in this not place, right? Not even a tree. Exactly, not even a tree. He says it. It's a complete desolate place where there is a mournful expanse. Okay. The genius of the Zionists, because they were geniuses, because they had, th again, they built a rhetoric of their own, they used accounts like this from non-Jewish people and they generalized it. Well, here it is. It's not us saying it. It's non-Jewish non people saying it. Mm -hmm. So it has to be true. Mm -hmm. But it is just one account among yes. many. You are, it's, this is what we call cherry picking. You choose to ignore the reality, the historical fact, but you are choosing to focus on something that is completely natural. Yeah. If you go anywhere, if you go, uh, you, if you go to 
Alge Centre in the in the peak of summer, yeah. you will find it desolated because it's too hot. Yeah. And so when we speak about 19th century uh, land of Palestine in the middle of nowhere, you are visiting, you are wandering around, and you're not finding anyone. Of course, you're not going to find a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So it it doesn't speak to common sense. Yeah. So the, the the Zionists are going to use this kind of narrative, these kind of narratives, and use it to their own advantage. To fuel their propaganda. Exactly, it's propaganda. Yeah. So that's one example of what uh, of what the Zionists did. So we've spoken about the 19th century situation in Palestine. We have given it context in Europe. We have contextualized 19th century Palestine itself. We've spoken about the declaration. Balfour Declaration. Now, there is something interesting that I would like to talk about here. Uh, it took place in the United States mm -hmm. in 1939. The, the Zionists organized what is called, what was called, the Jewish Palestine Pavilion, and it was organized in New York, in the New York's wo uh, New York's World Fair. And it is exactly what the name suggests. It was a pavilion. But once again, it was propaganda. It was lobbying. They had invited a lot of important political figures, not only just in the United States, but from various places in Europe as well, in order to rally as many people as possible to their cause. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, and I've said this at the beginning of the podcast, if you remember, I said that Zionism was not as clear-cut as we know it today. Right? Yes. There were three schools of thought present uh, in this pavilion. The first one was led by someone called Louis Brandeis. Okay. He was a leader, he was a leader figure, a leading figure of American Zionism. Mm -hmm. And his version of Zionism was, again, very condescending, very in line with, with the imperialism of Western powers. He said, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with American history, mm -hmm. but if you remember the beginning of the British colonies that settled in North America, in North America, they kind of saw themselves as beacons of democracy, bringing enlightenment to the savage American Indians, the native. Uh, yes, the which is which is a persistent, very dangerous ideology. Exactly, it no. has never it has never stopped from existing has never stopped from influencing American thinking and even Western thinking in general. No. So Brandeis says, yes, we need to go to Palestine, but we need to go with the purpose of being a city upon a hill. The same discourse that was used by the pilgrims when they first set foot in North American colonies. It's the same thing. He said that is the Jewish diaspora, when going to Palestine, needs to be a city upon a hill. What did he mean by that? He means that he was going to illuminate the lives of the indigenous Palestinians that, that who were living there. We're going to in, we're going to bring, we're going to take with us our values, our principles. We're going to influence them. We're going to show them the right way to live. We're going to show them what it means to be civilized. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a very patronizing, this very Western way of imp uh, imperialized way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. As bad as it sounds, as bad as it is, there was another school of thought which took things to a whole no another level. Because as patronizing as Louis Brandeis and the likes of his were, you kind of see an imperial benevolence. He thinks in his mind that he's doing a good thing because he's going to civilize the savage people. Yeah. Comes another school of thought called uh, the Yishuv group, and these people say are absolutely appalled by the idea that they are going to help the indigenous Palestinian people. It is not, they say, not about the indigenous people. It is about us. Yes. It is just about establishing our, our land. Yes. It's very in line with what we know of Zionism today. Mm -hmm. They were absolutely disgusted at the idea that the Jewish people would establish a homeland just to help the others. So for them, there would be no partitioning, there would be no cultural, uh, no cultural heritage sharing of sorts, nothing, nothing to do with the Arabs. Uh, the, the main purpose of establishing a homeland is for us. Yes. We don't care what is happening with the Arabs. If they are uncivilized, let them be uncivilized. If they are civilized, good for them. We do not care about the indigenous people. 
we don't care. Uh, uh, the first and only purpose of the Zionist venture is to, to establish a land in in uh, in Palestine. So, so again, as bad as the first trend of uh, the the first trend of Zionism was was completely patronizing, these make it and uh, take Even it to a whole new level yeah. by saying that uh, anything that re is related in m any shape, way, or form that relates to our, to the Arabs, we need to negate it. We need to refuse it. Mm -hmm. And then the third strand, which is the most surprising and probably the least famous out of all of Zionist thinking, is called cultural Zionism. Mm -hmm. Cultural Zionism. Called by, uh, led by someone called Had Aham. He was a Jewish thinker. Interestingly, unlike the other two strands, he mm -hmm. says that Zionism is not about migration. He says, it's, yeah, we can send a little, a few Jewish people to, to the Palestinian land. Okay. There's no problem with that. But it should not be mass migration. It's not about settling mm -hmm. in Palestine. In fact, he, he equates the diaspora as an important part of Jewish cultural heritage. He says that our diaspora is what defines us as Jews. Okay. Because we have been prosecuted throughout history and it needs to continue. We cannot go settle in the land of others through means of mass migration. And become the, the prosecutor. Th he becomes? Because uh, suddenly the, the Jews themselves are becoming the prosecutors. Yes, exactly. Because, uh, exactly. because this is a reversal of roles. Yes. The Jews are becoming the oppressors in this role. Yes. And he wants to avoid that. He says, it's all right, we can send there our people because there are sites of pilgrimage. Yes. It is important that Jews have... Jews have uh, have a recorded history of living there for a number of years and he says that's not going to change but to aim for a mass migration is a mistake what he aims for instead is a, re a renaissance of, col of Jewish cultural values which is good which is which would be a good thing exactly yes. and there are and there are people there are Jewish people nowadays who call for this kind of uh, Judaism but yes. nowadays the irony is that these kind of people are labeled what? Extremists. Oh, okay. You see, and the... Okay, that's, that's amazing, yeah. Yes, and so, and so there is a revolt. So of the progressive things. people are called the extremists. Exactly. The extremists the are the normal people. So the most yeah. progressive strand is nowadays called by Zionists, hardliner Zionists, called as extremists. Okay. Because they don't see an issue with the diaspora. Because you, but, but this is true, they're not lying. Mm -hmm. Diaspora has been part of your cultural heritage. Yeah. You say it yourself. You have been exiled ever since 70 AD by the Romans and well before mm -hmm. and well afterwards. Yeah. Why are you denying that? Yeah. Uh, they are not inventing anything new. In fact, they are taking a moderate stance. We are going to send people to live there in co coexisting. But not while kicking people out absolutely. of their houses. Not, but it should never be about mass migration and mass settlement at the expense of uh, other people. Mm. That is to say, the Palestinian. Yeah. Unfortunately, that strand did not gain a lot of supporters. Did not uh, did not have a lot of uh, did not rally a lot of important figures to their side, and it would be the issue group who. We, uh, the modern Zionism would morph into the second strand that we have spoken about, which is that we establishment of the Jewish national home just for the sake of establishing a Jewish state. And that is, and ironically, once again, that is seen as the moderate stance, whereas people that are calling for a truly progressive stance are seen as extremist hardliners. Okay, okay. So that's... That's an event that is not known a lot about a lot of people, but it's important to talk about these kind of strands. It is the 1939-1940 Jewish Palestine Jewish Palestine pavilion that took place in uh, in uh, New York. But it's important to say it's not the only pavilion that took place. Okay. There were many of the sorts in various places of the world, in Europe, in London, in Paris, in various places. And I think, and that's my opinion. This is where the there is a, m a missed opportunity perhaps for the Arabs is that we never had something like that. Yeah. Zionists are good at lobbying. Mm. But have you ever heard about, for example, an, an indigenous Palestine pavilion 
where people uh, lobby and rally for the cause of and, and show and expose true uh, reality, uh, historical realities. Yeah. So th that's maybe what the Zionists did well, is that they, they took the means of propaganda and they used them in a really good way. And of course, when you organize this in the United States or you organize this in London, you're going to attract a lot of attention because it wasn't just a pavilion to expose Zionist thinking. It was also fundraising. Yeah. So it was fundraising for the Zionist cause. Yeah. So you see with the, the how quintessential these kind of events that took place, mm. in what way these have helped the Zionist cause in succeeding. So there's a lot more, there's much more than just uh, when we speak about the Balfour Declaration, when we speak about the recognition for the Israeli states, all of these are playing an important role. All of these skewed narratives that are used by the Zionists, all of these arguments, all of these fundraising that were taking place, all of these are going to help their uh, their agenda. Yeah. You see, you see what is taking place. Yes. So that is the 20th, m 20th century context for what is taking place in the Zionist side and was taking place in Palestine. And then, of course, there is uh, there is the Second World War. Mm -hmm. There is the Second World War. And then the United Nations as an institution was established. Yeah. And then they partitioned the land in 1947. But in 1946, as early as 1946, what the UN did was to set up a committee to assess the situation in Palestine. Okay. Because there was more and more migration taking place in Palestine because of the Second World War and because of the Holocaust. People taking refuge in Palestine. Exactly. Which who were welcome there. Well, we, it was refugee, but at some point, well, let's also call it what it was, it was settler colonization. Mm -hmm. Because it was forceful. Yeah. But, it's, but it, it was also, but there were also refu refu refugees. refugee people. Mm -hmm. No. So as early as 1946, the UN sets up a committee to assess the situation in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And in 1947, they make a report and they say that the Palestinian land needs to be partitioned between indigenous Arab Palestinians and newly established Jewish people. Yes. What we need to talk about here is who was that committee? Who did that report? Mm -hmm. It was a committee set up of various countries. Let me just cite a few. Peru, Netherlands, S uh, Sweden, okay. right? Uh, I think it was also France. And my question to you is, what does Peru know about Palestine? What does what do th what does the Netherlands know about Palestine? The what only stake country do they have either? exactly. The only country yeah. in that committee set by the United Nations that had any kind of proximity to what was happening in Palestine was Iran. Yeah. And not surprisingly, Iran was very skeptical about partition in the land. Yeah. So that committee, uh, um, you know, it would be tantamount to saying there is an issue here in Algeria, and they would send you somewhere from, uh, I don't know, from, from far Japan, from, yeah. who has an approximate knowledge about what uh, the historical takes or the historical matters that were taking place mm -hmm. in here in the region in North Africa, and they would be, and they, and he would, or Asian countries would decide them the fate of what what would happen afterwards. Yeah, you see that. So all of the countries that were in minus Iran, in th that were in that committee, had didn't have really any kind of proximity to uh, yeah. to t to the region. Unfortunately. It was uh, it was accepted and it was voted by most by most UN adherents. Yes. And this is what happened. And uh, and when Israel, the f Ben Dav David Bergenian, first I think president of the Israeli state, declared Jewish independence in 1948. That's also marks the Nakba, the first Palestinian Israeli, uh, the first Israeli war. Ethnic cleansing. Yes, yeah. and that's where mass mass exile, forced exile, yeah. took place on the Palestinian side, and as well as the beginning of the mass eth eth ethnic cleansing. So all of this, all of this, 
all of this is the background to what Zionism is, was, and what it is, and also what it isn't, what it had done, and how it how it had succeeded in making what in in also playing a vital role in what is happening nowadays. Yeah. So we can say, I think, to sum up, really, um, Zionism started vaguely with the likes of Theodor Herzl, mm. with the idea of establishing a Jewish homeland, a Jewish state, yes. even though it wasn't really exactly clear where, but that was the main idea. Mm -hmm. And then it morphed into the idea that it has to be a return to the land of Israel. And it has a re religious rhetoric behind it, it has a political re rhetoric behind it, it has a skewed narr historical narrative behind it, and all of this uh, is going to be used by uh, Zionists yeah. to this very day. And today we're just having uh, experiencing colonialism there. Mm. Uh, what what do you think would be um, a solution to, to this conflict? Some say uh, one state that would incorporate both Jewish and Palestinian people. Some say double state. Some say some say the re reincorporation of the uh, of a Palestinian state there. Mm. What do you think would be um, a solution? Well, I'm I'm by no means an expert on the Palestinian Palestinian issue, and to find uh, listen to find a solution for this conflict is a v is an extremely very, very tall yeah. order. Mm -hmm. There's, there are certain things, certain things or certain boundaries that we need to talk about when it comes to solution. Uh, and here I'm going to quote uh, two famous Palestinian defenders uh, of the defenders of the Palestinian cause, Noam Chomsky and Ilian Pape, because they were asked, and especially in there is a book written by Noam Chomsky called Understanding Power, mm -hmm. and it was asked. As part of the solution, do you think do you ever think that the Palestinians can ever regain their territories? And the answer he provides is kind of brutal. Which is he says, as much as I'd love to, as much as I would like to, it's probably a lost cause. If we are talking about territories that were lost ever since the nineteen sixty seven Six Day War, or about the current current illegally occupied territories, yes, there is hope. But if we're talking about pre-1948 territories, it, he says that it's probably not going to happen. For the simple reason, he gives examples. He says, let's take America and the, the ethnic cleansing of the Native Americans. Even it today, there are people who hope for the retaking of, uh, of, um, of the land by, uh, by the Native Americans. But the problem with the Native Americans is it's not a very good comparison because they were already a, d a dispersed people. Mm -hmm. They weren't just one people. It mm -hmm. was already like many tribes. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, they were it's a different circumstances. Yeah, it's a really different... Uh, and, a d and a dispersed kind of people. But still, it, it was their lands. Mm. And they kind of settled into accepting it f with material uh, or rewards or with, uh, with financial rewards, yeah. with compensations. So he's very skeptical about that. He says it, uh, uh, it's very unlikely that Palestinians will ever gain back their pre-1948 territories. But he says when it comes to afterward, when mass illegal occupation of territories that are Palestinian took place, he says there is a lot of hope for that. Mm. But how do you achieve that? How do you achieve that? I think, in my honest opinion, well, we have spoken a lot of recently about armed struggle, about armed resistance. And a lot of people are taking nuanced stance. He says it's not the solution, and it's just terrorism. And I would like to remind people that in the beginning of the Algerian Revolution, the first acts, the first events uh, that were initiated by the FLN, I must remind the people that even the international opinion was labeling those acts as terrorist acts. And they were against, some of them were against civilians. They were against uh, against civilians. Yeah. France to this very day is saying that La Bataille d'Algerie was fully a terrorist attack uh, perpetuated against civilians and not against military people. Yes, and that's what, what uh, actually when you, when you target military people, um, it gives, l it makes, it puts less pressure 
on the occupier but when you start tar targeting the settlers mm. that's when you go you start winning the war mm. because it's easier and it's more efficient to make people leave back or leave mm. uh, leave maybe the house that they took from you or leave the, the the land that they took from you mm. is by terrorizing them into doing it mm. the same way that they did to you in order to kick you out exactly yes yeah and it's so frankly speaking it's quite inevitable it's because the, yeah. the question is what's the alternative mm. because a lot of people especially lately and i see this as a social trend uh they love to decontextualize the whole thing yeah they say okay you because they're focusing too much on what is happening hamas has done one thing so it, it they're kind of kind of bypassing what has led to that Yes. You know, there is years of oppression behind yeah, that. Uh, the, the We're not saying that mm. violence is a good thing. No. Do we, is there anybody, you know, it blows my mind when you ask people to condemn the killing of babies or the killing of civilians. There is no sane human being on earth that likes to see people die, especially when it comes to collateral damage and civilians. But we must not forget the whole oppression that is, has been taking place for years. I don't know if you know, there is a, f um, a contemporary modern philosopher by the name of, I hope I'm pronouncing his name, Zizak, uh -huh. very famous. He has written an article, and he's kind of taken what is, has been called a nuanced stance. Uh, okay, I'm going to condemn Hamas, and I'm going to condemn the Palestinians, but I'm also going to n condemn the Israeli people. So it's... It's a lot of so it's kind of a neutral stance. Yes, but the problem with this uh, stance is that a lot of uh, Europeans, mm. and I saw that in a lot of European friends, even though they condemn Israel for what it is doing, mm. they don't realize how bad uh, colonialism is. Yes. They ro really don't see it as a really bad thing. As a so a, a friend of mine said that um, what they what what they think is that if they if israel had a different government mm. all of this wouldn't be happening <laughs> but the problem is that whatever the government they would have they would still be colonial people they would mm. still be occupiers of a land that was already yes. that already belonged to other people mm. they it's already it already would be a country or not a country a state that is um that is founded mm. on the basis of um, ethnic cleansing and colonialism, colonialism and uh, and putting people outside of their homes and outside of their of, of their lands so it's it's a very dangerous not a dangerous but th there's a failure of understanding of what's happening you see this in a lot of, you see actually in a lot of uh, um, uh, Europeans that experience colonialism they actually defend the Palestinians mm. when you uh, when you consider for example Ireland Ireland a lot of Irish people uh, support is uh, support yes. Palestine mm. because they understand what colonialism because is and is what it does. It is in their history. They have also yes. dealt with colonialism. Yes, but I see a lot of French people, a lot of uh, German people, a lot of British people failing to see the problem with colonialism. They are failing to see the problem because they are simplifying things, and this is something that Ilian Papi has talked about in collaboration with Chomsky in a book called On Palestine. He says that the oppressor does something, is going to decontextualize everything and render things in a very simple manner so as so f to for people to completely forget about the historical context that well, is surrounding when, the matter. When usually when they are about to lose the battle, they start saying, well, things can be complicated sometimes. Mm. Because even though uh, sim oversimpli oversimplifying things can, can be a bad thing mm. and can be um can remove context from the whole story but over complicating it is also uh could could also be a bad thing it could can yes. also be a bad because thing. because just just saying that okay 1946 there were people there mm. and suddenly you colonize them yeah. that's the story mm. this is why these people are fighting back mm. So I don't think the, the Palestinian issue is a very complicated uh, It, it thing. isn't. This is what any, any objective student of history will tell you. Yes. Because the uh, Palestinian issue, the 
Palestinian cause is as simple as it gets. Absolutely. It is an issue of decolonization. Yes. It is no more than that and no less than that. Yes. It is an issue of a settler that is occupying lands illegally. Absolutely. And all of this, all of what is happening today, all of the atrocities that are taking place are byproducts of that. Yeah. So you can't brush aside the the root of the issue which happens to be what you were talking about is that in 1946 a lot of people came in illegally and you try to partition the land in an unjust manner and then you s started expanding and expanding your illegal settlement into Palestinian land yeah. it is as easy as that yeah. but what people are doing here is that they are either oversimplifying it or they are overcomplicating things in the sense that they're telling no 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 there needs to be some nuance what kind of nuance Marco Lomax is, uh, has a very good thing to say about this mm -hmm. if you don't stand for something you will follow for just about every anything yeah it's not nuanced there is an issue and it has roots and you are ignoring it how many times I mean it's not just historians talking about this how many times has the UN condemned Israel the UN has condemned more than any other country more than any other adherent country combined yeah. throughout the years yeah this is a fact yeah so the issue cannot be ignored there is an issue there is an evil taking place and it has roots yes don't tell me that it is the, you, you can nuance it as much as you would like but the roots are not going to disappear no as much as the Zionists like to claim or talk about their roots that the, the, the Romans kicked them who kicked the Palestinians yeah this is the same thing yeah so we can't you can't possibly ignore the mm -hmm. the roots of the issue yeah very ironic um, very ironic situation mm. Ahmed thank you very much for clarifying uh, the history of Zionism to us thank you for having me uh, thank you for helping in increasing awareness over the issue um, I think it's quite important it's quite quintessential yeah because quite for, uh, as I've said there's a lot of influx of information trending and I'm sure that it stems from good intentions, benevolent intentions, but I think we need to go deeper. Because most people are saying that the Algerians support the Palestinian cause, as we have always done so. But this is common to no knowledge to every single Algerian. Yeah. This is yeah. not something new. Instead, we need to build a different kind of... We need to know in detail what has happened in the past in order to understand better and how we can possibly remedy to what is uh, happening nowadays. Okay, thank you very much, Ahmed. Thank you. See you next time, maybe for another subject. Inshallah, I would love to. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.